Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and this week's uh, DevOps Lunch and Learn on February 2nd, we talked about machine controller pattern, which is this idea of using uh, Kubernetes object to CRD um, to then interface back to real infrastructure. And I have concerns about this because I feel like it really simplifies the infrastructure and the group uh, had a really good discussion about why it's good to do that and when it's dangerous too. Hope you enjoyed the conversation. Stirred up something interesting and then I got an Amazon Matt Wilson pissed, pissed off at me. Uh, <laughs> I was, I was wrong. So he's right. He's right to be grumbly. Um, I had thought that, and Greg, you might remember this statistic. Um, when, when I was at Dell, I remember hearing the statistic that like 65% of workloads in Amazon were windows in the 2008, 2009 timeframe. Um, and it was, it, I guess it's clearly was wrong because, um, Matt, Matt was basically, they were Linux only initially, and then they added Windows support in 2005. So I don't, I don't know where I got that uh, idea. <laughs> Do you remember that? I mean, Rocky, that was one of the things we talked about in OpenStack days was Windows support. Um, and it's, it's around that same time frame that we're talking about. So like 2010, 2011 was the early OpenStack. Right. Yeah, I was just barely aware of of Amazon at that point. Here in Silicon Valley, most of the startups weren't aware of it, and so they were just spinning their own servers in their cloud in their closets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> at least the youngsters, the older folks, I think, were aware of it. And Netflix, of course, was fully aware of it. Yeah. No, I mean, we, we were doing a ton of work with Joyent in the 20, 2010 era, um, which is early Facebook. And people were like spinning up Facebook games on Joyent because Joyent was close to the Facebook data centers. Ah. And they, they weren't good for that much because it was all Solaris, but they were fine for a Ruby stack. So you could build a really cheap, effective, fast um, Facebook app on giant servers, pretty. Well, you um, could have run VMware and VMware already had Windows by that point. Hmm? And so you could run VMware on joint and, you know, do the, the whole cascade thing. But again, VMware wasn't, um, wasn't known to the smaller folks. It's like AWS grew up from onesies, twosies, generally, and some larger, larger folks, but not many. And uh, VMware grew down from the, the, enter, the large sites and enterprises. But I mean, what I, what I recall with the Microsoft stuff that we were doing, the Azure work, Azure didn't have infrastructure as a service until 2013, 2014, like they were PaaS only for a yeah. while. Yeah, Azure was late to, well, Azure was late to the game because it was still Bill Joy and um, mm -hmm. Balmer. As soon as they got rid of Balmer, things changed rapidly. And Balmer actually, I think in many ways was much more of the reason Microsoft had their their reputation. He, I don't know if he was just like protecting Bill or what, but he was the nasty one that enforced the, the nasty culture. <coughs> Although Bill was extremely broke in Asperger's. Mm -hmm. I'm not a good enough observer to make any comment on that, I will say. But um, it, it was definitely a, an interesting, right? Microsoft definitely got caught flat-footed on a lot of technology curves um, in, the, in the 2010 10 era um, from that perspective. Some of, some of what I'm, I'm thinking about is this, um, 
was it Matt As it was it Matt Assay? I think it was asked a question about what would what would uh, Amazon be? This is one of the questions we're going to yeah. ask Thursday. Yep. Is is uh, what would Amazon be without open source, or what would Actually, the cloud be without would, open source? What would our cloud environment be without open source? Who would be the cloud guys? And and uh, I got into that a little bit with somebody saying Oracle would be one of the cloud providers and someone else said, but they didn't have an operating system. I said, but they have Solaris. Somebody else said, but they in that timeline, they might not have Solaris because they wouldn't have gotten Sun. It's interesting because well, they acquired Sun, boy, in the time, in the 2013, in the 20, 2009 timeframe. It yes. was just after I went to Dell right. and, um, because Joint was all using Open Solaris and Google, not Google, Oracle. The Oracle acquisition basically stomped on that for them. Yep. Um, it's interesting because I, I, I don't feel like Linux, and this is just my own arc, maybe that Linux was, you know, as mainstream until after twenty. 2010, I guess Red Hat was doing just fine, so I'm wrong, but. Red Hat was doing okay, but it was it was still the smaller companies that hadn't, it really wasn't at the large enterprises. It was startups and, and uh, small companies and um, small enterprises in 20, 2009, 2010. <coughs> Which is why they weren't of interest to any of the big companies. Otherwise, HP, IBM, hmm. Oracle, some of the others would have tried to buy them up in that time frame, and nobody was going for it yet. It's interesting. I, I'd be curious to think about the, the topic I was going to talk since, uh, John, you're here and Arjit's here and Derek. Um, I was going to transition us to talking about uh, machine controller stuff in a little bit, but right now I'm enjoying shooting <laughs> the breeze about uh, some of the these historical transitions right because i remember the transition with mac to os x and the bsd core and all of a sudden you had native tooling for linux um and that's when that to me is when a lot of the developers switched over macs became a real development platform uh i guess I they always were but sorry well and my question was about when the Mac architecture went to Intel because they were all ARM up until a certain point, and then they went to Intel, and that also made it mm. easier for the Linux crowd. But Ajit knows more, I think. Hi, I, I heard my name. I'm sorry, I just caught the tail end of that question. Uh, no, I mean the, the chipset has uh, you know gone back and forth. Um, they, Mac, they were building their own chipsets um, than than Intel, um, but you know, I, I quote unquote came out of the closet and openly started using <laughs> Mac <laughs> in public uh, when uh, OS X came out. Right, so th that still is a while, while back. You know, I was a System Seven geek way back when, but of course, in public, it was still an x86 running uh, Linux on it. I think Rob, that's that's where you are right now, correct? You never transitioned to Mac. Actually, I was Mac, um, like in the early MacBook Pro days. I have a, a every once in a while I crank it open just to make sure that things still work in it. But um, I was Mac back in the early early days. Actually, it was funny because I was schlepping to Dell in the early OpenStack days, and I brought my Mac in for OpenStack work, and so I was literally carrying their the laptop they gave me and a Mac to work every day. It's just brutal. Um, that's why, that's why I'm tilted on one side. Um, <laughs> but yeah. And then, and then I switched, uh, and I switched, I guess with rack and I did, I've been Linux, uh, exclusively since then desktop and laptop. Yeah, I have I have very superficial understanding of any Microsoft OS OS per se. I mean, you know, yes, now with Azure, <laughs> fine, but you know, but 
Microsoft Core OS. Um, I, my formal training, you know, throughout the university, I was hacking the OS. I had, you know, phone book size inside Macintosh manuals mm -hmm. <laughs> for all my honors projects. Uh, so we were still using that. I, so I, I just stayed with Mac throughout. It wasn't until a project came around where the vendor, where, well, actually where the company wanted to have the first app rolled out on Windows. Uh, where I started looking at Win32 API just to actually start building the software. Um, and that actually was you know, sophisticated API, uh, Win32, for application developers. Uh, learned so much from just that one project, things that perhaps I should have learned in school. Um, <laughs> actually, building a project on Win32 API taught me a lot. Um, but, you know, that. Then you started actually having, you know, dual boots, Linux and Windows, but you know, was, that became the dev platform for a while. But you know, it's been Mac forever. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, I've, I, I have had relatively little experience on the Mac side of real development. Um, I got my first because I was doing some iPhone development way, way back, um, way, way back. Oh yeah, so. Um, you had to have a Mac to do. I think you probably still have to have a Mac to do iPhone development. That probably sold more more Mac laptops than anything else, right? Well, now AWS has Mac Mini as a service. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that I hadn't thought about that since they announced it. They actually <laughs> literally rack Mac Minis. That's yep. what that's what blows me away. Um, <laughs> oh, it makes sense. That's just like uh, the the folks who did the the supercomputer for uh, Apple. They were always kind of outsiders. Hmm. Uh, so and they would move in and out of Apple depending upon what Apple felt like. You know, they had the experience, and they had the culture and whatnot. So Apple would keep rehiring them as they needed it and then laying them off when they didn't think they needed it. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, well, heck, I mean, I was at a company that had an app for the announcement of the iPhone. And so we had to go out and buy a few uh, Macs and there was competition because there was all young bucks pretty much in the development side and so there's competition for the who got the mac and who got to do the work for the on the iphone side of things but hmm. we were just qa and we could do qa we did qa on the phone itself but uh looped was in the announcement for the first iphone like like part of the the it, applications the, and stuff the or big reveal for the iphone included the our app Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. That must have been, it's funny in hindsight, it probably was, you know, exciting, but I don't, yeah, I don't remember when the iPhones came out. For, I mean, I, I mean, the classic what the throwing the hammer, breaking the glass type of thing that they did on uh, the ad. 2008. 2008. Yep. 2008. And that was, that was the beginning of the end. We got the, iPhone, and then within a year we had Android, and our number of OSs and phone requirements went from over 150 down to just a handful to do all the, the QA, supposedly. The hmm. phone company still had lots of uh, non-standard stuff, like even today, keyboards from phone to phone to phone. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I, I stand corrected. 2007. Okay. I just looked it up. That sounds. Yeah. I know. I know. It, it kind of tracks well because this is when I just was coming out of academia and I joined the MC, um, and that mm. was, you know, quote unquote, the company phone. But I had my still Palm. <laughs> yes. I had so much written for Palm Palm OS that I didn't want to move. And I just said, nah, you know, when I do the upgrade, it'll still be Palm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it, 
uh, within a couple of years, it was still a question of you want iPhone or you want Android. Didn't take uh, Google very long to get Android out there and working to a point that people would accept it. Although they stole a lot for, to make that happen. <laughs> well, and they also, it was also an acquired OS, if, if I recall. Well, that, they, that explains why it went so fast. Yeah, no, they bought, they bought a company um, and, and then became the, the provider for that. Every, I mean, that, iPhone, iPhone three really kicked everybody in the butt and they, Windows, Windows realized they were behind and everybody sort of jumped on. But yeah. Makes a ton of sense. Do people want to talk about the, um, service, the machine controller pattern? I'm, I'm happy to go into open source more or talk other topics. No, no, no. I was uh, gonna scratch my you. itch. We, we, can, we can talk about. So uh, tell me what topics did you have in mind for the machine controllers? Um, so this was sparked by a um, Chris Short video of they, they spent an hour going through the machine controllers. Um, and I'll tell you the truth. It was I was my jaw was dropping from just how complex and sort of confusing it is. And then we had a conversation in the rebar community about somebody who was getting excited about cross plane and sort of driving infrastructure through the CRD models. And it still feels like um, we're flattening the objects out. Like, like we're, we're making this control point for infrastructure that feels very um, flat. It's, you know, infrastructure, when, when we're dealing with infrastructure and you're dealing with a piece of infrastructure, doing, you know, CRUD operations to control infrastructure feels like you're, you're not actually controlling the infrastructure. You're, you're making a wish and hoping it comes true. <laughs> um, and so it, it feels, it feels like we're all excited because Kubernetes offers us a way to create these custom objects. And so we're just, you know, using the, the object store type that we have. Um, and, but yet people are super crazy about it. And I'm, I'm curious about why. What do you mean when you say it's flat? Um, so when, when, go ahead, Rocky. No, I was just thinking, uh, John, for asking that question. <laughs> so when, when I take a piece of infrastructure, um, and I've watched this, this go for a long time, and this is very infrastructure focused, so machines, um, the, you have the current state of the machine and then you have, you know, usually we have some actions that you can take against the machine, like reboot, um, reset out of band management. Might not you might not care in the cloud at all, but then you you have a workflow that transitions the machine through multiple states, um, and that workflow is you know you might it might still be a state. Hey, put you know, start this workflow, but there's so much information that then flows back through that process that you want to see and monitor and all the intermediate states and, um, you know, what's happening behind the scenes. So there's like a whole system that has to be connected together to make a, an, an infrastructure change happen. Um, why don't we take a really, let's just take a really, let's to, to get some feel to it. Why not take a really simplistic example? Okay. Right. So when, when you talk about all these things that need to happen, and, and let's just say that this is going to be provisioned a new, a new VM, right? Right. So what are all the states you envision that need to happen for that VM to be provisioned? Uh, what, what are you assuming uh, is the existing state? So I would assume nothing. Right. I mean, to, to provision a VM before I can actually provision it, I have, there's a ton of information that I have to know or imply, and it, there's maybe no difference, right? I might have good defaults, but I have to know the cloud. I have to have the credentials for the cloud. I have to have the type. I have to know the region. I have to know the image that I'm going to deploy, the networking, 
that I'm attaching it to, um, SSH key that I want injected into the, the system, right? There's a, there's a lot of information that gets as a prereq before that machine even, even can be instantiated in a cloud. Yeah, exactly. So my, that was more a rhetorical than, okay. <laughs> um, no, but it, it was, uh, it, it matters, right? Uh, what, uh, yeah. where, what state are we starting from, right? Um, are you starting, you know, where the infrastructure is there and then you want to instantiate the bare metal, you know, put the essentially a, a host OS on it, then the guest OS, and then instantiate a VM on top, right? I mean, are you starting really, really from scratch? Well, let, me, let me take it yeah. a second. Yeah. Just, that, that's a whole nother level. I would stick to just VMs for now. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. so I was, I was going back to like, let, let's go really old school, right? So in, in the old school days, it would go, hey, Rob, I need a VM running, you know, uh, CentOS, whatever, with X amount of, of gigs and X amount of storage, and I need, you know, connectivity to this network. Right, and I would go to my operations team and I would literally tell them that in some form or some other piece of things. Right, they go provision the back domain and then they would give me user credentials, go log into it. Right, that's the way we've kind of done things historically, right? So when I think about these things, I think of it less about we had a historical way of doing these things and now we're turning that into a programmatic method of doing these things. Okay. Right. So that's why it's, it's kind of useful to me just to go back to how, how did we used to do this? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, well, this is the this is the allure of Terraform from that perspective, right? You're because in, in a, just a pure Terraform model, what you're you know you've at least got a single file that you're going to say this is what I want to build. Yeah. So so Terraform was one abstraction that that. So what Terraform did or other things are, are attempting to do is they're attempting to, to add syntax to the request, right? So if I say, go give me a VM with XYZ and, and whatever, connect to this network and these pieces to it, the odds are in an old school form, they got it wrong, right? Because we didn't have a dialect to actually express what we really wanted. Yeah, okay. So I, I think some of this is just adding syntax to how you express infrastructure. And, and that may be several different pieces of infrastructure that need to be put together to get the desired end result. I guess, well, it's definitely this, the, the connected to other pieces of infrastructure is definitely true, right? I mean, it's, it doesn't, I, deploying one machine by itself is not particularly useful uh, anymore, right? It's all gonna, it has to be connected infrastructure. We should make the assumption of that at least. Yeah, and so I think about people like Crossplane, which I, I really think they have very little to do with the infrastructure provisioning. They, they do more service provisioning, right? They, they've simplified this to say, you know, what's the bare minimum I need to know from an application developer to go provision something? And how it gets provisioned is the, the job of a systems engineer, right? It can be completely manual, and then it eventually goes back and it gets done, right? or it can be fully automated. I, you're 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 making an assumption that I think is is proving increasingly true, which is developers are are the idea of DevOps is not not true. There's developers and there's platform engineers, so which I think we should roll with. I'm just calling. I'm just making it as a statement. And there's actually a discussion on Twitter right now, exactly along those lines, <laughs> of, of whether DevOps really exists or not and what the division really has become <laughs> so yeah there i think really i think it's different. organization specific though there there are truly devops individuals and even orgs out there that try to focus on that as a, a way of being i think mm. um and and you know there are of course degrees of success but I think that there really are some groups that, that kind of try to have that as a major focus and, and move forward, both the operations mindset and the developer mindset, you know, simultaneously. But, you know, it's, uh, I think, again, it's, it's, it's varying degrees of success depending upon the organization, depending upon whether or not management actually buys into it and hires the people and is willing to spend the money on people who are capable of both mm -hmm. operating in a operations mindset and a development mindset. Um, it depends on whether or not they expect 
you know, their, their devs to just be, you know, boilerplate devs who, you know, are, are, I don't want to say grunts, but, you know, who are out there just knocking out code and not caring what runs it. Um, you know, which that's, that, that, that in my experience is, is a lot of what, you know, from a management perspective, what right. they want, you know, we want a grunt. We're going to, we're going to subcontract it out, you know, across the globe right now and you get what you get. And they don't care what the ops, you know, uh, impact is, but. So yeah. one of the things the thread taught, one of the things, one of the people on the thread pointed out was that the whole DevOps uh, and informed plat platform aware developer is, is just kind of the extension of the whole agile. The whole team should be fully independent, no product managers, no other managers. They just throw out everything complete uh, and it works perfectly kind of agile approach and DevOps is so, sort of part of that in one perspective is broken perspective, but you know, there are a lot of broken agile out there too. So it's kind of, there yeah, are folks there who to work and then there are the average companies. <laughs> so Does anybody I, do agile correctly out there? Well, some people think they do. Well, uh, some people who wrote the Agile Manifesto uh, probably get really close, but most of the folks who wrote the Agile Manifesto also believe it's artisanal, and so it's boutique, so you don't build big things with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I tried to tackle this topic, uh, I guess it was two years ago now, thanks, uh, COVID. Um, and, and the talk was at the DevOps Enterprise Summit, talking about how to end DevOps shaming. Like we, we have to stop trying to tell people what they see and believe is just wrong and how that is actually anti-DevOps from a community and, and position standpoint. Um, so I, I developed a visualization of how we can kind of all come together to common goal. And I can share it real quick. I just downloaded it onto my computer and it addresses some of the things we were just talking about. Um, so developers are equivalent to race car drivers. They want to go fast and they want to, they want to complete their circuits as fast as they possibly can. In order to support them, they need platforms and services and tools. Um, your operations folks have had to modernize to help provide the track. Uh, your DevOps engineers, if you will, are providing the tools to help them accelerate and go fast and your SREs, are focused on making the track safe and responding whenever there's a crash and, or there's something in, in, on, the, on the surface or anything that can slow them down or make it unsafe, if you will. And you know, this, this analogy can be you know, uh, uh, modified. I, I haven't touched it in a year and a half, but the focus is how do you keep the devs driving and focused on driving and going as fast and, and their energy only on that and all the other supporting players designed to do their part to accomplish that. Heads up display, like visor display, telemetry data, track conditions, all in heads up display. <laughs> that, that, that's it, right? You know, you can. Man. And actually that's something, the heads up display, that's uh, an area where this, this friend who was doing release management and build, build and release for VMware. Uh, they now have teams and whatnot building heads up displays for build and release. And the problem is, is these folks decide what the build and release team want and need, but don't talk to the team. And so it doesn't <laughs> quite come out with <laughs> what is useful. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the, the reason I use that, and that's a very good example, Josh, um, and I have some experience racing on tracks, um, not every track actually supports heads up displays. So even if you know your gear has it, uh, your race helmets have it, uh, the track doesn't support it because you, know, you don't have measuring telemetry sensors out there on tracks, right? Uh, so the heads up, what, what heads up display lets you do is as and when there is real time maintenance <laughs> going on, 
in around the track, telemetry data that's coming in about climate, you know, temperature of the track, et cetera, different, different temperatures at different bends on the track. Uh, all that is getting fed in. Um, so you know exactly what your threshold conditions are. Uh, any upgrade that happens on the track, you know exactly what's going on. Yeah, so you, you get access to informed decision making. Absolutely, right? I mean, you can still, there's always a backup. You know, you'll still have the flags waving, right? The hazard flags, you'll still have all that stuff. And there's still a lot of gut driving, but, um, you know, you don't have to constantly shift from looking at horizon like three turns down as opposed to what you're going to encounter in the next second and a half. Interesting. My assumption had been that the heads up display would be as would be more for your own car. I'm assuming it still is for your own car condition too. But then it gets just too cluttered, right? Heads up display is just showing you the track, the track conditions, what's going on on the track. Um, Interesting. You still would like, you know, and again, right? It's you don't want to clutter your your vision field. Um, so, you know, even that, the displays that are as close to your to your wheel itself, the steering wheel, that's giving information from, about the car, that's there. But, you know, there's, there's as little information as possible, um, you know, maybe just speed and RPM, and that's, that's perhaps it showing up on, on the HUD. Interesting. It makes the platform analogy super interesting from that perspective, right? Because if, if we come back to, what we're doing with a machine controller, right? Then, then, then that's the same sort of concept. It's it's restricting the information that you need to have. Or am I taking the analogy the wrong wrong direction? No, no. Yeah, it's it's what's important. What needs to be there, uh, real time, as opposed to. Well, oh, so for, for yeah. example. For an example, you know, you got one one metric, tire temperature, tire pressure, right, on a okay. car, right? Does does the driver need to know what their tire pressure and tire temperature is at all times? No, they need to know when it's hitting certain parameters, and they need to be notified. Uh, braking temp brake temperature, for instance, are my brakes too? Are they getting too hot and and you know potentially causing a wear event? Do I need to change my driving pattern based on the conditions of the environment that I'm? you know, participating and, and, and navigating. Um, what's important is making sure that the right information is presented in an actionable and timely manner, and only then, um, not presenting all the information all the time. Yeah, it, it's similar to the hospital stuff. There are all these monitors, there are all these tools, and they got to the point where alarms were going off every which way, and there were tens of alarms going off all the time, and it mm. was absolutely useless. <laughs> It becomes alert fatigue, like mm -hmm. car alarms. <laughs> yeah, alert fatigue or you know, yeah. things, you, it out. things you don't want is, um, yep, yeah, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. No, uh, I, I don't want that cluttering my field of vision. That's right. You assume alive <laughs> yeah, exactly. until there's an indication that alive might not be an actual state of being. <laughs> Absolutely. Like the EKG blips that they show in hospital equipment, blip, blip. I'm like, that's taking up screen space. <laughs> um, to use your analogy for brake fluid, that actually happened uh, to me. Uh, you know, the brake fluid has, should have been changed. It was way past the boiling point. Ooh. I'd gone through a full weekend of racing. Uh, and, you know, you don't even have kind of um, real-time information, many a times not even coming from the car. There, you're hoping somebody will be able to tell you, right? Somebody really, really experienced will be able to tell you uh, from a car feel. Uh, it just took me a while to say, hey, th my brake fluid is gone, right? It's completely lost its viscosity. <laughs> it's going. And, you know, in and, two and you don't want to find out that way. <laughs> oh, Absolutely. <laughs> But the minute I pulled over, they had these huge fans coming in and trying to cool down <laughs> before the car caught fire. <laughs> have you have you seen the movie wow. Ford versus Ferrari? Yeah. No, I have not. I, I, oh I, I don't watch films. I don't watch movies anymore. I mean, maybe if, so I haven't seen one in a decade. Uh, you should watch this one. Yeah. Uh, if you're a racer, you didn't enjoy it. was a really good one. <laughs> I've heard it was good. I haven't seen it. Oh my yeah, gosh. Take, it a, take that a step further, right? Is 
you know, there's all this telemetry data flowing around. Like one of the problems I had with the logging stuff is we were collecting so much telemetry data, it, it consumed more than our service. Yep. Right. Pretty bad for CDN. Right. So, so the other part of it is I only want to collect some of this data under certain conditions. So telemetry data doesn't need to continuously flow. A lot of these things will change what telemetry data actually gets collected. So it's not just a question of, of how you display it, because there's different audiences that care about different things into it. It's a question of how much do you collect and at what depth do you collect if you collect at all. Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I actually talk about this a lot, no surprise, um, given, given where I am. But I, I liken it to nobody wants a single pane of glass. What they need is the ability to zoom in and zoom out based on the context that they need to investigate. Right. And, and in doing so, you have to make a choice between full fidelity of your telemetry or your data in general and sampling. And the you know, arguments, engineers will say, well, it's got to be full fidelity all the time, or it's like, I'm good at sampling is good enough all the time or whatever. Both of those statements are wrong. Um, I, I use the analogy of photography, digital photography. The average consumer and the average person taking a picture, most of the pictures are going to be perfectly fine with a JPEG and sample data. Uh, photographers who are using that data for specific purposes with editing or very specific deliverables are going to require and expect raw. And then you've got photographers who are going to do raw for everything because they just never know when they're going to need to use it for something. And they're just willing to accept the cost associated with the uh, storage, the slowness, comparatively speaking, of processing the images and things like that. The same, same is applied to the data that we collect in our environments. Um, you know, we, we need to be mindful about what we need to accomplish with the data and deter make that determination then whether or not we need higher fidelity or uh, what sampling level is, is necessary. And then most importantly, be able to adjust that as those needs change. Data identification, one of my most favorite, favorite subjects, especially with hardware developers. And categorization. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, and categorization. Oh, those, are, those are real. I mean, this, this to me is the, this is, but we're describing why the machine controller stuff feels so flat to me. That's um, what I mean. I have yeah. 200 yeah. petabytes of simulation data that I may or may not need. But if I had to recreate it, it would take, hmm. you know, six months of machine time. You know, it's like, do I do I actually pay to keep this on my really expensive discs, just in case I might have to crunch it again, or you know, and, and, and getting getting hardware engineers to actually tell me whether or not that's useful data or not, they don't know. Well, that's, they won't know until they need it. <laughs> exactly, and that's and that's what and I constantly have to fight. In the in the five years yeah. that how and growing uh, the simulation farm, the team went from uh, a less than a gigabit, gigabyte file for chips to needing 64 gigabytes per chip yeah. uh, for per simulation and, and uh, it's the, the DSL. And we went from a, a 14 gig NetApp that was only partially used for a, a specific chip and design to, I think it was 10 full up uh, two terabyte net apps just for the same size team. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Rob, when you, Four or five mm -hmm. years. When, yeah. when you refer to it as flat, right? Let, let me, this is what I'm hearing. I could be completely off. Right. What we're describing is a, a very complex system with lots of different parts that are moving back and forth. And, and I think you're kind of looking at the current definitions for the machine controllers and say they address a very small fragment of that. Is that what you right. mean by flat? Uh, it is. And then also the, the way the way that you would interact with those systems. And I, I, I think we're getting maybe explaining it from that this this perspective, the way you would actually interact with infrastructure is is more complex than you're going to get from a simple object definition. 
or that object definition is going to explode in complexity based on the, the use cases. And that well, could, could just be it's not, the, it's not the purpose. So let me give you two different, two different ways of thinking about that today, right? Sure. Let me give you part of where I think the problem is today. And, and I kind of describe it this way. Uh, I am building a house, right? <laughs> and so imagine every room I walked into, instead of having just standard metrics bolts, it had 10 different types of bolts. I mean, you have 10 different sets of tools. Sure. And then imagine I've got a 20 room house and the problem is that every, each one of those 20 rooms has another unique set of tools, right? The, the complexity yep. of managing that type of system is is either cost prohibitive or simply not not capable, right? And, and I would I would state a lot of our mm. complexity today comes from the fact that's the world we live in. Yeah, we, we have a I lot of one-off tools that are in these components to it. Oh. And, and then just to put one more thought out there, and I'll, I'll let people reply, but I, I'd also say that when, when we had that conversation in 2030, there was this, you know, functions are the begin all and end all because no one wants to worry about how they provision infrastructure and everything's going to be a function. Well, that, that's not a true statement, right? But I, I would postulate the opposite of that, right? Why, why isn't it in 10 years is that we've been able to standardize enough of these things. We've been able to put up best of best practices that provisioning infrastructure is no longer the pain it is today. Why wouldn't that be the part that gets improved? Exactly. So, so um, I want to provide a, a go ahead. standard, but I, yeah, I, I think I don't converge. I think the L that and at least common. I mean, oh boy, I have a lot of feels on this. Um, somebody else was going to say something, and my thought will hold. If um, well, I was I was going to argue that I think reality for for most um, is more like the um, the evolution of the automobile, right? If you could drive a car in 1940, you can drive a car today. The core components of a vehicle has not changed. What's different between 1940 and today, aside from you know they go faster mm -hmm. and there's more there's more safety or whatever, is that eventually we added anti-lock brakes and cruise control, right? And those systems added complexity and you know automatic at first transmission. and automatic transmissions, right? So if we just use those three as an example, right? The adaption of that technology onto a, a pretty standard platform enabled greater safety, then enabled future innovations that was built onto that. Now we have adaptive cruise control where the cruise control is modifying your acceleration or you're slowing down based on the conditions around you that uses 10 different sensors that's checking the road and all this other stuff, right? So it's, it's that compounding effect as technology continues to evolve and new capabilities because of hardware and because of software, empowering and cap new capabilities off of existing or, or fairly uh, but, standard frameworks. But that <laughs> that analogy breaks down because of the overlaps in 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 integrations from this perspective. What right? What you've that in the case that you're talking about cars, you know, have had to coexist. Multiple generations of cars have had to coexist. And the drivers have had to coexist across across the domains of, of different cars. What we're dealing with in a technology perspective, I mean, John's analogy of the house having different different you know uh, standards in each room is actually the the model that we're talking about, where somebody's literally has you know the the way the APIs and the things that you plug into and and stuff that you interact with are, is friggin' different mm. room to room. I mean, we haven't, we're, we're moving away from standardization, not well, towards it in a lot of that cases. Might be true, but cars also had that same thing under the hood. The user interface never changed. But you look at cars, you have two, three different standards for buses when they actually started bringing signals in that, that could yeah, but, be but, into but computers the, and... and no, I mean, cars, cars were not moving towards standardization until right, you know, uh, governing bodies stepped in from that perspective, right? Windshields weren't standard features; those were legislatively added. Right. Um, yeah, you know, it's 
press the pedal to go, comedy. press the pedal to stop. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, if if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna tell me, and and I would accept this that the that the idea of a machine controller is a least common common denominator version of a machine, so a developer can abstract that away and say, just give me one. You figure out how to implement it. Um, I, you know, I can say, hey, that makes a that that makes a ton of sense. You're, it's an abstraction point. Um, well, I mean, I think the challenge that we're highlighting, in, in large part, is: are your environments, is your machine, whatever you're developing, um, mm -hmm. suffic sufficiently accessible that someone that has worked on something similar but does not it could actually have a transference of skills and be able to come and work on your platform, your system and your environment? Um, or have you created such a like microcosm in the way that you do things that your availability of talent to, to actually work in that space diminishes greatly as you continue to mature it? So, so let me roll back two decades, right? So we, we were at this state in the late 19, whatever it was, 90s, right? When, when the net first came about, we had a bunch of disparate tools and you couldn't find a developer that had a common set of tools, right? And, and the way that got changed is someone put out the LAMP stack, right? And within five years, LAMP became like 86% of all web services out there because it solved the tooling problem. I could just get it and load it, right? It solved the developer problem because it was easy to find LAMP developers out there. Right. right. So what, what I would argue is we're at a position right now where we've taken the, the environment that exists with a LAMP stack. And, and I, be, I believe you're right, Rob. I think we're going in the wrong direction. We're accelerating it. <laughs> right. And creating more, more, um, more, heterogeneity. For, more it's heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. and that stuff. And balkanization. So, I'll use that word the last week. I liked it. Yeah. So, so, you know, that's not a good thing to do. And I'm not saying that cross playing or any of the other people have it right. But I do think that, that the challenge we have is if we can't start creating some set of commonality in terms of how we manage, I don't care what scope of the, the machine controller you envision today. If we can't start normalizing some of that down to a set of tools, right, the problem is just going to get worse and worse. So I think it's a necessary step to, to begin solving that problem. I, I like I like where you're taking this and that helps me me understand the motivation, which is I, I guess really what I wanted to talk about. If if I don't want to mess with infrastructure and you could say, look, just give me this minimal, you know, a machine and I can say poke it, I need it, I need it to do this or that, that that strikes me as as useful. Um and then I hadn't I hadn't uh, somewhere, but somewhere behind the scenes, somebody has to absorb that, that capacity, right? I mean, you're in your house analogy, what we're, what you've described is you're going to, you're going to run around your house, which has all the different outlets and you're going to then bolt on a common plug that, you know, works, works for you, even though the outlets are different in each room, right? You have an abstraction layer. For all your outlets, well, it's, a, it's you're talking about. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not. I, I think. I think that's the state we're in today, right? Okay. And I think the state we want to be in, right? So when I look at electrical adapters throughout the, the world, I know when I started traveling 20 years ago, <laughs> they carried a much, a much larger set of adapters, <laughs> right? But but over the years, I can usually carry three adapters and plug in almost anywhere. So what I'm saying is, if you want to, the way I'm thinking about this is, how do we avoid having the problem? of 20 rooms and 20 different sets of tools, how do we start normalizing that down? For maybe I only have to carry three electrical adapters, right? I want to simplify the problem that, and where, where's the highest pain point or where's the um, lowest um, entry point that begins solving that problem? Well, I think you, you really uh, have to narrow down to what is the, you know, the core consistent functionality. Like we deal with this with infrastructure and try to make infrastructure extensible. Right. You've got 16 different storage vendors who have their own special sauce. But you know what every single one of those storage vendors need to do? They need to create a volume. They need to expand a volume. They need to decomp uh, um, not decompress, but um, uh, anyway, you, you know, reduce the, the, the 
storage state, thin provision of volume. All right, there you go. Um, and then you need to decommission a volume or you need to back up a volume. Like there are very, very consistent things that have, have to happen for each of those. Um, and they're really non-negotiable. Everybody's gonna have to do those. The yeah. framework that they do it shifts. So what's needed is a consistent mechanism or interface so that no matter what you're using on the back end, you make a specific type of call, you get a specific anticipated outcome. And if that vendor requires additional information, maybe it's assigned to an account or assigned to a pool or something like that, right? How do you, you, you then have mm -hmm. to find a way to obfusc obfuscate that. So like with outlets in different rooms or interfaces in different rooms being vastly different, how would you accomplish it there? Well, you'd either use an adapter or you would plug something in that would create an interface, like maybe one of those um, Wi-Fi adapters on a power outlet, right? So that it then becomes the controller so that you're using a, a abstracted control plane in order to control the behavior there. But every time you do that, you add a point of failure, you add a point of complexity, of course. you add a point of... Yeah, but then I can, just tell my, <laughs> I can just tell my device to turn things off. <laughs> right, like, the, 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 I think the other piece that's missing in that too, right? So what's hard about that, right? If it's not controlled via some form of standard, right? Is they introduce breaking changes. And, and if you've got 15 vendors moving at 15 different release tempos, trying yeah. to maintain that level of abstraction becomes really difficult. Well, right? that's so what the standard is. Yeah. Maybe, oh, yeah. So, yeah, but the, the other part I'd, I'd throw out, and, and this is probably not the topic for today, part of this problem I think also becomes because the, the tool network is not treated as code, right? Mm. Too much of this is still scripted, right? It, it's not kind of a first class citizen of the development process. I would, I would actually suggest it's not that it's not treated as code. It's not treated as standards. Uh, code is a way of being, of providing a standard in some way. And really what we're looking for is standards. And, and you can't uh. get there until you've got, right? Most standards get beaten out by the, the big guys who sit there and say, okay, our customers want to work with us and our customers want to work with you. And so let's come up with something where, uh, like Josh was saying, the least common, mm. the lowest common denominator, and then we can differentiate above that because we know our stuff is better. The problem with that is standards boards, you know, stands are usually met by standard boards. Standard boards tend to be floated <laughs> with vendors who want to pull the board in their specific direction, always. And that's yep, just agenda. every time it's, it's always that way. Every, every standard that we've set, you know, TCP IP, um, you know, let's take one of the most obvious, you know, uh, DNS, uh, all, all of the standards, they end up getting polluted by manufacturers trying to pull it in different directions to give mm -hmm. them an advantage or a, a, a benefit. Um, and I just, standards are great, but they tend to get polluted over time is the problem. Well, I think there's two types of standards, right? There was no standards board for LAMP. No, no. It right. solved. It was a it was a fact of standard because it solved a real world problem. And yeah. I, I did. I sat through too many IT. Solved ideas. it well. If it yeah. if it had been a pile of junk, it wouldn't have been used. <laughs> it solved it well until there were competing things. So <laughs> well, no, it, it, it solved when it. Nginx, when Nginx started kicking the crap out of Apache. That's that standard lamp stack was no longer a lamp stack. Yeah, but I think we can argue that 90% of the needs that people have today could still be solved with lamp. <laughs> I mean, in, unless you want to, yeah. unless you want to scale, and then PHP falls on its ass. Right, but I mean, yeah. the the <laughs> yes, that and and that's the point, and and that, that kind of goes. I, I think that kind of goes back to to what I was trying to imply earlier, in that. You know, for instance, with vehicles and the evolution of how the technology and the extensibility of those vehicles change over time, it's it's a result of new demands and new expectations. Um, you know, uh, vehicles today absolutely are safer than they were in 1940. Um, their core function is still to get you from A to B safely, right? Now they just do it 
more safely and with more comforts and more features and and just more of the car doing things and more and more chances of breakdowns because they're more complex well and greater uh, arguably places. arguably mm. but I mean, wait cars have gotten more reliable they've just gotten yeah. harder for you to work on yourself right well, the, the aspects that existed way back when have gotten more reliable, but the new stuff, the new functionality keeps keeps the, making the braking easier. <laughs> I, I, it's, yeah, I mean, there's there's something, I mean, I, I like the, 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 the understanding here of the pattern that we're talking about as creating a more, a, a higher level abstraction that I can, that developers can, you know, just say, I'm going to deal with it. Um, makes sense, makes sense to me. I'm watching us then, you know, we're still not very good about implementing the complexity behind the scenes because it's, it's hard. Um, and so I guess, I guess it's, it doesn't feel like we're, it feels like we've created an abstraction layer, but we've made the abstraction layer dealing with the fact that it's going to be heterogeneous even harder than the fact that right we've well sometimes abstractions are brutally are, are actually make makes your job much harder well it depends and you know let's not assume the dogma that there's only one singular abstraction right depending upon the visibility or depth you want uh, even commercial software you know you have sdks but then you have apis as well right it just depends mm -hmm. how deep you want to integrate how much more customization do you need? Um, and it's all not strictly having abstraction pull you up on the stack. Uh, we're seeing this in networking gear, right? Uh, actually networking gear throughout, not just where you're exposing, allowing people to program even the forwarding plane through P4, right? The, the standard that's emerging now for uh, the programming interface. Uh, even when you get into the container networking world, um, you know, the CNI mm -hmm. was a standard, 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 and they were able to bully and push Docker out that doesn't support it. But that's not a part of <laughs> their, their container networking standard. Um, but you have that, right? It's visibility of the networking stack all the way into the container realm as well. Uh, it just depends you know, how deep you want to go. So you could have multiple abstractions. Um, let's not just assume that there's only one and hey, you know, where do we slide this abstraction barrier? You could have multiple abstraction barriers. Yeah, and I think it really hmm. always comes down to what is the desired outcome of the people who are interacting with that device? Um, you know, when I yeah. was trying to automate infrastructure, what I was trying to do wasn't necessarily what other people are trying to do in some respects um, but at its core the the things that were most interesting and and uh, most discussed were just common basic things that everybody needed to do um, regardless of what the infrastructure was underneath um, you know and I, I continue to think about you know going back to cars ODB2 uh, OBD, OBD2 <laughs> right like that has become it took decades, right? But that became a, a standard interface with a standard expectation of being able to get information from the car's computer. Well, as the computers on cars evolve, ODB2 as a standard interface hasn't in, uh, evolved, but what reads the information from ODB2 also evolves. So you've got this staggering thing of Computers and cars have more information that they can present to ODB2, OBD2, but there aren't readers for OBD2 that know how to actually take that data, visualize it, and make it available until eventually they do. So Yeah, it's a bootstrapping a, problem. Right. There's this on, Exactly. There's this ongoing thing. However, what doesn't change is that that computer never stops sending information about the O2 about the you know or the air quality in the vehicle, the RPMs that's running, the um, uh, what's the other thing that they're the all standard. Doing? Yeah, yeah the, there's there's big standard things, and those don't change because so consistently around the country and around the world, that information is pulled and used in order to make 
cars oh. is unsafe and like it's consistently used and once it becomes consistently used you can't remove or deprecate that that capability it becomes a standard yeah i i need to keep thinking about this and we're at, we're out of time on it um y'all have helped me understand it better quite a bit which i appreciate it's abstractions are, are you know the minimal set on an abstraction makes a ton of sense josh just like you're saying yeah. um it it does make but you know on closing thoughts it absolutely makes a lot yeah. of sense and uh, to piggyback on something josh said earlier as well uh you know he mentioned just uh fidelity it's fidelity frequency both of measuring and monitoring I'll, again you know i like to give real concrete real world examples uh, the infrastructure that we have, um, you know, it's between NVIDIA and Sonics. NVIDIA uses the Mellanox switch, the backplane. Mm -hmm. It's all together. The backplane telemetry data is because it's InfiniBand, it's being used by the control plane on the Mellanox um, the switches themselves. Uh, that's right. how, how it actually is measuring and monitoring. It's, you know, where the rest of the accepted uh, units are like milliseconds. Uh, there, we're looking at freaking micro, you know, you go from 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 6, because that's really what's needed to adapt the control plane. Now, when yeah. you say some, you know, uh, sim control body comes in and says, well, you got to capture all that data. I'm like, how am I interleaving <laughs> freaking microseconds into your Splunk? And what, what decision making am I making there? It, it's yeah. not required outside the back plane. It's use, it, it has a scope. It only resides within that. Now, if I need to really start troubleshooting, then yeah, you know, sure, I can go in there. But freaking 10 to the minus six, are you kidding me? There's nothing useful I can do with that. But today. it's still needed. It's, it is required, absolutely. Yes, yeah, today. today. No, this is, this is the, the, the interesting evolution here is that there are base, base features, base capabilities that we've, we've evolved as standard base features and capabilities. And then you have to be flexible enough going forward that an, a new emergent a new emergent set can show up. Right, turn signals were not common in cars until they emerged as standard in cars. Right, yep. and then, um, and so so there's the, this is this is, and and this is the. Um, yeah, it's, it's weird. Maybe I just need to think about about how these about machine cut controllers as emergent sets. But if they're going to play in the ecosystem, I'll, I'll tell you, UCI governing bodies you know, that, that do bike races, for instance, right? There was a time there was an overlap between um, essentially mm. disc brakes and bikes. I'm talking about road bikes, disc yeah. brakes and classic brakes. UCI would not roll out disc brakes because mm. that meant every 18 teams, right, with let's say two or three other wild cards, Unless every bike had disc brakes, they would not press out disc brakes because you can have in the same bike race, you can have somebody that has the ability to really, really stop and others will keep drifting. Even if they have the same reaction time, one machine really has an aggressive stop and the other doesn't, uh, it's unsafe, right? So you could have, it, that, that's how you end up with unbalanced systems, right? So if you're talking try to have a, a log collector that's making decision making real time and it's collecting millisecond 10 to the minus three and 10 to the minus six, both at the same time, something that you optimize for one, right? It's, it's a freaking, you know, uh, you talk about a factor of like 3x, 4x all of a sudden. Yeah, I, I think you make that's a great point mind. about yeah, great point about <laughs> balanced systems. Yep. I don't think people think about system balance. Um, it's one of the things I like about DevOps. They're like optimized at the constraint. And a lot of that is, you know, balanced flow, right? But, um, yeah, no, that's good. Real world versus theory. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot, a lot to think about. No, and right. if you don't think about this, you end up with insane crashes and then you go postmortems. Oh shit, how did that happen? Um, you know, when UCI was rolling that out, there were people saying, oh, well, you know, different teams mm -hmm. have different advantages all the time. I had my distributed system hat on and I go, no, UCI is doing the right thing here, right? A governing body, I was actually siding with them where most of the cases they've come up with pig headed regulations. Yeah, I was backing them up. I'm like, they're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And you well, felt dirty. <laughs> 
I, you know, it, it helps. I, I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to governing standards. I've certainly watched it. Watch us try and do it the other way around, and it can be a mess too. So yeah, but UCI they they have pushed regulation on what the freaking sock length should be. You know, bike. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, and, and there's there there are definitely times when things get wired get try to get wired to a vendor's advantage, and I've I've witnessed that considerably, and it's very frustrating from that perspective. Um, yeah, no, that's that's been that's been hard. Um, I have more thoughts, but we are out of time and I want to respect that the time limit. Everybody, thank you. Uh, this is this is something I want to bring more people on who who understand this and then we'll we'll keep I want to look at actually building them. Um, but, and then at some point, Ajit, I do want to I do want to put you on the hook for the Sonic. I haven't forgotten. No, um, I know. Uh, so there I'll, I'll tell you, I have a full piezo set that I already did. And I'd like to be able to, I'm, I'm waiting on that approval. Um, okay. Yeah. You know, as long as, as soon as it comes I'll, out of embargo, I'll, I'll show you, I'll share it with everyone. I will keep reminding you, but when you're ready. <laughs> All, right. All right. Bye guys. Thank you for listening. Uh, I hope you uh, got something out of this discussion. We go long as always and uh, tune in the Thursday conversation on uh, February 4th. We're going to be talking about, open source and cloud providers and what inflection points get created in them. And that will be a really interesting conversation. Uh, so check that one out too, the2030.cloud, if you want to participate. We're looking forward to having your input and discussion.